Good morning or still good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be here and I also want to thank the organizers of this meeting. And uh, I also have to thank a virtual organizer, Matthias Sonnleitner, former PhD of mine, who, uh, whose results I'm presenting mostly here. They are not that new, but he was involved, I think, in the original idea of having this meeting here together with Philip and Dennis. So I'm really glad that it finally came to place and we can meet in person. Uh, I'm also a bit uh, happy about the previous speaker because all of this originated in a research stay in Gila when uh, we were thinking about uh, uh, black body radiation gradients in the clock. And I thought that, well, if this gradient, if there's a spatially dependent uh, intensity inside the clock, uh, there should be forces. And this started all the thinking. And uh, here we also have, a, most of the work was done by Matthias Sonnleitner uh, quite a while ago. Some work by Daniela Holzmann later on and other people in my group. And as tweezers are part of this business, also Monica, uh, my wife was involved in the early development of some of these models. So, uh, there was two questions. One question is, uh, is uh, a hot body also an optical trap? Uh, uh, what about black body radiation forces? And the other question is, if uh, particles are illuminated by, by broadband radiation, are they still sort of interacting with each other? And there have been some proposals uh, that this would simulate something like gravity, some very old proposals, and we heard Louis already talking about this a bit in the last thing. I mean, uh, the first paper was almost 10 years ago. I didn't, uh, it, time is going so fast. For me, it's not 10 years ago, but if you look at the date, it was 10 years ago that we handed this in, and the idea was extremely simple. Uh, so when, what we heard before, black body radiation induces a start shift. And I don't have to talk about this now, but, and the dominant term is proportional to the local intensity, which is again, roughly proportional to the fourth power of temperature. On the other hand, around the hot sphere, the black body radiation is a radiated field. So it's a propagating field outward. So the intensity has to decay as a function of distance roughly as one over R squared, but if one looks a little bit closer, we see that the intensity uh, has a slightly different behavior, but roughly decays as one over R squared. So if we put these two things together, we get a potential. So the shift uh, of an atom can be seen as an optical potential, and we get a space dependent optical potential, which roughly is a one over R squared uh, shift. Uh, potential times sort of the shift of the the state that the atom is in. And uh, if we di differentiate this, we see that we get a force, yeah, which is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature and inverse proportional to the third power of the distance. So we have a one over R cubed force originating from a hot black body. And this could be like in an optical tweezer where particles are drawn towards uh, the maximum of the intensity. Uh, at least as long as this shift is negative, which is true for all ground states of atoms. Uh, so which force is it actually that is acting here? Because we know that there is the radiation pressure force, which is just that a photon is absorbed and re-emitted in a different direction, and this goes on cyclic. Yeah? This is sort of this random uh, spontaneous emission force or uh, radiation pressure force, and this is dissipative force, and definitely for our hot body would point outwards. It would repel particle from the source because the pointing vector is strictly going outward. And so uh, in most scenarios, especially astrophysics, this is the only force that is considered. We are talking about a gradient force, and the gradient force is based on sort of uh, absorption and stimulated emission, or let's say diffraction of light. So there is sort of 
uh, two amplitudes of the incoming wave are re-scattered into a different direction, usually in parallel direction, and by this momentum is transferred. So we get this sort of force that I have been talking before from as a conservative force, and it's due to the diffraction of the black body radiation. Yeah? And it attracts particles to the, towards the source. The question is sort of what is more important and, and why. Okay, as we have seen again, the force, uh, sort of the dipole force is interpreted as a spatially dependent stark shift. Usually one considers isotropic black body radiation, so uh, there is no force because everything is homogeneous. But if we have a sphere, it's sort of the solid angle that the particle sees from the sphere which determines how much radiation it receives. And so the formula can be easily recast in terms of the uh, solid angle, the temperature, and the shift uh, that uh, the particle gets. So we have sort of a very uh, naive and simple expression for this force. And we can sort of just look how this potential looks like. So here's the one over r squared part, and we see it's basically a one over r squared part once the distance is of the order of the radius of this sphere. If we come closer, we get a more uh, sort of divergent part of the potential. So we get uh, almost half of the potential is acquired in a very, very close distance to the surface, but we will not be concerned too much with this now. Yeah? As hydrogen and all ground state atoms always have negative shift, this is definitely an attractive potential. And we can compare it to, to other potential. I mean, we know that the gravitation is a one over R potential. Then uh, from if we put the charge on the surface and we use the static polarizability, then basically we got a one over R to the fourth potential from this. Uh, and what else did I put here? Uh, okay, the full and the one over R squared potential. So these are sort of three uh, forces which uh, slightly behave different in space, but they can be still compared in, in their magnitude. So this slide I can totally skip. There was a few very nice important slides before. So if we look at hydrogen at 300 Kelvin, the ground state shift is very small, 0 0.5. 4 hertz, and we're only concerned with one digit here. That's enough for our considerations. In rubidium, it's a hun almost 100 times bigger, but it's still actually a quite small uh, shift. But we know still there is this fourth power. So if it's sort of 10 times hotter, we have four orders of magnitude bigger shifts. So it's, it can be something. And for higher lying states, of course, as we have heard before, this shift is bigger. Uh, so we can now again make a comparison of the prefactor of this shift uh, compared to the gravitational shift at the surface of this sphere, yeah, which is this blue line. And here we have a sphere of, uh, with a density of water and the radius, uh, the radius of the sphere in meters. So there is a one meter sphere here. And here is a temperature increase. So we see that uh, for small objects, uh, the gravitational shift is much, much smaller than uh, the shift from even room temperature. And if we go to higher temperature, uh, this uh, radiative potential dominates the gravitation a lot, at least for not too large objects. Huh? Uh, again, we can compare with a single charge on the sphere or with a charge density of one nano coulomb, coulomb per square meter, which also then gives some kind of uh, prefactor of this uh, radial dependence of the force, which is also roughly at the same order of magnitude for this type of situations. So the examples taking the sun, of course, gravity is stronger by 15 orders of magnitude than sort of the uh, sort of black body radiation power. For a human, uh, it just balances. So a hydrogen atom in front of you is attracted the same way by your heat than by your mass. So 
uh, hot bodies are attractive. If the particles get really small, and if we still think that this can radiate black body, radi normal black body radiation, which we now heard last together is, is, is fairly wrong, but at least roughly correct, then we see for these small particles, uh, it's totally the opposite. So it's billion times stronger, uh, the shift from the black body, then it comes from the uh, gravitational part. So another just simple example, if we take a round sphere of one meter uh, at different temperatures and there is hydrogen atoms flowing in with very slow velocity of one centimeter, we see that the hotter the sphere is, the more of the hydrogen is captured by this sphere. Yeah. It's not a, a huge effect, but maybe a factor of 100 bigger between 2000 and Kelvin and 100 Kelvin. That's actually really slow hydrogen. So, but still we have not uh, discussed the question, is, is the radiation pressure bigger than the other one? Because this is what we heard when we talked to astrophysicists. They say, this is nonsense. We have a strictly outgoing pointing vector, so there, it's impossible that there can be an inward force. Uh, it's just not possible and in none of their models. But we can see about radiation pressure, we, the light has to be absorbed. So if, if we take sort of the black body curves for different temperatures and in hydrogen, of course, there is the uh, sort of gigahertz line. But here at 100 Kelvin, it takes 10 to the 10 years for one excitation. And to have an optical excitation at 300 Kelvin takes forever. At 1000 Kelvin, still it's 10 to the 42 seconds until one of these black body photons is really absorbed by the hydrogen. So this is totally negligible until about 6,000 Kelvin. So it's actually quite, quite interesting that if we look sort of at these uh, contributions of the radiation pressure compared to this black body force, that they roughly meet at the temperature of the sun. So it, it's fun, the sun is still a dip from the point of view of radiation a dipole trap for atomic hydrogen and helium, uh, uh, whereas uh, usually it's assumed that the uh, radiation would push away this field. As we saw before, gravity is many orders of magnitude bigger, but it's a one of a cube potential, so uh, the Kepler ellipses become in principle spirals. Yeah. Anyway, oh, there was one slide missing. Ah doesn't matter. So if we take lithium, we see it's the opposite. Lithium is pushed away at the sun temperature already quite strong. So solar winds will push out lithium, uh, but they will keep the hydrogen and the helium uh, if we consider the radiative force. So uh, we see that the black body radiation from a hot object actually can have a dominant gradient force surpassing the scattering force. And there is a discussion if this could be compatible with uh, pointing vector arguments. It's a one of our R cubed force and grows with force power of temperature. It's very weak, but there are some cases where it's comparable to gravity. Yeah? And the force is bigger for larger polarizable particles or atom, more complex atoms, but also of course the radiation pressure force is bigger. So we can have sort of uh, some kind of black body tractor beam, we have the right temperature of the object. And there were so many doubts uh, that this force exists that uh, one would have to measure it and Philip and his co-workers in Berkeley uh, uh, could be convinced to do the measurement and I th might be there is more in some of the later talks, I'm not sure, so I'll skip this here. You will hear it that this force is not a theoretical fiction, but it's real. Uh, anyway, I skip this here. Uh, are there scenarios where it might be important? Now let's look at the at the hot dust cloud, hot in the sense of 300 Kelvin. It's a Gaussian distribution of small hot particles with uh, sort of uh, rather small density. I forgot now what the de what density Matthias took. But we can see that for such a dust cloud, and we can uh, calculate the potential created sort of 
by the black body radiation compared to the gravitational potential. So if this uh, dust cloud has a size of like 10 meter uh, mean square uh, radius, we see that uh, the black body part of the potential will attract the hydrogen much stronger than uh, what it would be done by the gravitation of this cloud. Uh, so in, in some sense, one could say that hot dust is more attractive than one would think uh, from the point of view of gravity. So this was all uh, single particle physics, but there is multi-particle physics, and here I have to mention Franco Sainz, who unfortunately died a few years ago, and with whom I collaborated at least in words. So we never published something together, but we talked over many years about uh, effects of the same thing if more than one particle is involved, and Louis already, uh, Louis already showed us uh, some of the nice results. So basically, we, we have sort of one of the dipole which is illuminated, it will radiate the field, sort of the dipole field, and this uh, dipole field will interfere with the field radiated from another, of, an, of a second dipole nearby. So we have to superimpose these two fields and the interference will then determine the momentum transfer on two of these atoms. So we can again get a potential for each atom, which is sort of the local laser field, plus the field from all the neighboring dipoles. We put it together, we square it, and then we get our sort of uh, optical potential for this uh, field. And we can use now various approximations. One would be sort of a fairly narrow band, but uh, field, but with random faces from all directions. So it's a bit of a uh, frequency filtered black body radiation field. Again, we can put in this result and uh, work out these integrals, and we see that the interaction potential between two atoms has this sort of shape of a sine function because it's fairly monochromatic, and but it decays only with sort of one over r. So it's fairly a long range uh, interaction potential uh, with some modulation on top of it. Uh, you can even uh, work it out a bit more if we take linear polarized light in one direction uh, coming from the set direction and the particles moving in a plane. And what we can see here that there is a certain intensity, uh, limiting intensity when this cloud will start to collapse. So if it's too weak, uh, the p temperature will overcome sort of this binding of two particles, but there is a clear instability. So here we see uh, such a simulation with a lot of particles, and we see that they, uh, in some phase because of the sign, will try to form hexagonal patterns, but whenever two particles come too close, they will collapse into uh, one particle or will be destroyed. So this is a very simple toy model. If we now replace it by the full black body radiation, there is no extra minimum, so there is only attraction, and uh, all the particles within uh, a certain radius determined by the temperature will be sucked into one field, so we have a collapse instability. Again, we heard a bit about, uh, by Louis, about an experiment measuring a certain version of this first, showing that this is also something real. Uh, well, astrophysical scenarios, so that's, I have to be very careful, I'm not an astrophysicist at all, so I like 1D scenarios, and one thing that we could think of was sort of a ring of dust particles around the star where the illumination is radially, so again, we only have one coordinate, which is sort of the angular coordinate phi, and for this, uh, we can sort of write down Boltzmann equation or collisionless Boltzmann equations, or some people would call it uh, less of equations. We can solve it only for gravity, so we choose a density where gravity itself would do nothing, so along the whole angle, the particles would just stay, and this is sort of the velocity coordinate, but once we add the radiative uh, corrections, so we see that the gas will, uh, so the hydrogen gas will evolve and together the dust particles which are in this cloud and we can sort of, in this very simple model, induce sort of collapse 
like a gravitational collapse, but it's a collapse induced by uh, the black body radiation or of the center of sun. So I think I'm almost done with the time is finished. So I would have some extra slides on how to measure such forces in sort of quasi 1D systems in the lab, but I will skip those ask for questions. So this 1D situations could be simulated in evanescent wave fibers and uh, we can design all kind of potentials. But again, if we looked at black at the black body illumination of such a chain, which is a 1D chain moving along this fiber, we see again that there is a, a collapse region, but there is still a region where sort of uh, particle uh, repel each other. So it's uh, because it's 1D and infinite range, it's not always collapsing. So the, si the particles will, in some sense, uh, acquire also re those who are far enough will uh, require a periodic distribution. And they will sort of confine light between them. And the more particles we have, uh, the deeper this confinement or the faster uh, the collapse will be. And this brings me to the conclusions. So there are gradient forces or dipole forces even in a totally incoherent field as long as they have a spatial distribution. And these forces can be stronger than uh, the forces by the naive radiation pressure. And it seems that uh, the interparticle forces by such incoherent light fields might be even more important than these gradient forces. They turn also up in homogeneous illumination, but because they are between two particles. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure if uh, Juanco invented this term, but he used it many times. He called it a mock gravity, which might be uh, important at some point. Okay, then thanks for your attention. Thank you, Helmut.